Hello, my name is Ankutza Fedorka, and I am from the National Institute for Research and Development in Forestry, Marine Dercha. And I've elaborated this work together with my international collaborators, which are part of the Bear Connect Consortium of the Center for Large Landscape Conservation from International Union for Conservation of Nature from World Commission on Protected Areas and from Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative. Our work was focusing on how to create a safety network for, for nature and to apply connectivity conservation in a center which represents a jewel of uh, Europe in terms of uh, connectivity conservation. I am extremely sorry that we cannot be in person in this um, uh, conference, but let's hope uh, the situation will change and we will see each other in the very next future. How did we start the work? We started a few years ago when uh, a, a first project was implemented and the project was called CoreHabs. And then we continue the work under the Bear Connect Horizon 2020 project, focusing on securing roaming in this uh, wild corner of Europe. I will tell you a few things about the context and the challenges. Our country is situated in the Carpathian Mountains, which is the largest continuous forest ecosystem in Europe. It's well preserved and has natural habitats, large herbivores and carnivores, such as brown bear, wolf, and lynx. This um, uh, country represents a biodiversity hotspot at the crossroads of important biogeographic regions. Of course, we do have our own threats in the region, and those are the changes in land ownership and infrastructure development. Even if we are in the situation when we do have 30% of the country covered by forest and includes virgin forest and ancient beach forest, most of them are privately owned. Oh, however, 24% of the country is included in the European Natura 2000 network, but this uh, network is specially disconnected and requires a lot of work and effort for establishing connectivity, especially for species which are having large home ranges such as brown bear. As I was telling you, Corehabs, which was the initiator of the ecological corridors work for both habitat and species, brought together two public universities, one national research institute and three NGOs to design a national ecological network. Of course, we designed uh, the corridor modeling as a decision support tool for stakeholders. And we created opportunities to develop infrastructure while considering the ecological measures, which are so much needed to ensure the long-term viability of species and habitats. This work continued with other two projects, which one, out of which one is European, funded by Horizon 2020, and it's Bear Connect. And the second one is national, and it's called Nucleo. And they were focusing on the brown bear to investigate the degree to which existing ecological networks, which includes national protected areas and Natura 2000, ensure landscape functional connectivity and ecological sustainability. We did have numerous partners such as the ministries, agencies, universities, institutes, research institutes, local and regional councils, private forest owners and NGOs. Within the first project, we developed the mechanism for identification and assessment of, of ecological corridors. But in the same time, we had numerous meetings and trainings 
to provide specialists in local planning and implementation of a national ecological network for conservation. I think this was the main legacy of this project because we were able to train more than 250 people to have a minimum expertise in ecological network, conservation design management and monitoring of the ecological corridors. Bear Connect took the work further and has developed functional connectivity maps and in the same time decision tools on how to react and how to handle different situation when developing infrastructure or uh, building um, other anthropic uh, facilities. Of course, by having this knowledge together with our uh, results from our project, we are considering that we are on good track to protect the current ecological network of protected areas and ecological corridors. We still need to adjust our legislative part and the procedural part. But in order to see how can we do that, we have proceed in November 2019 to organize the first ecological connectivity conservation workshop for guiding the Carpathian region. This workshop was jointly organized by our institute under the umbrella of the Bear Con Connect Consortium and coordinated directly by the Large Landscape Conservation Center and the IUCN WCPA Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group. We here tested for the first time the IUCN guidelines for conserving connectivity through ecological corridors and networks. Of course, while we tried to build something and great things never came from comfort zone because it was a real challenge to take this for the first time. Uh, we had a very good uh, coverage of the workshop participants. There were over 50 scientists, conservation experts, natural resource managers and policy makers covering 13 countries. The main goal of the workshop was to participate in this innovative exercise using field data results, various results from spatial, genetic, and ecological analysis, and the IUCN guideline to contribute to a more effective ecological connectivity conservation. We've chose this area of, of focus because it's very special and we've called it the green circulatory system of the Carpathians because it ensures ecological connectivity and eco an ecological bridge between a natural park, a national park, and few Natura 2000 sites as they are represented in the right in the figure one. And here is the Bucej Natural Park. Here is Piatra Craiului. And here with the pink, they are represented the Natura 2000 sites. As you can see here with the green shapes, these corridors, they were existing in early 2000 and they were mapped by my colleagues from uh, Research Institute. And with the red, we did again the mapping and using the modern tools and so on. And those are the areas which are actually now existing. And you can see that the areas are much smaller than those ones in early 2000, which means that there were a lot of changes in the, in the area. And here we've identified a new and important area for connectivity and we've considered it in our analysis. We were benefiting from various supporting materials which were collected and proposed and prepared in advance for the workshop by, uh, in, uh, by, research, by our research institute and the Center for Large Landscape Conservation, 
of course, to respond to the various activities which were this, which will be described below. There were extensive data sets and maps, and of course, that we used various sources such as um, international projects and national projects, including those which I already mentioned and others, uh, pro other projects funded directly by the European Commission and other national funds. And then we, we had breakout groups which were supported directly by a facilitated and by, by a facilitator and the rapporteur. And the participants worked step by step series of activities that sought to guide discussion. As you see in the right, the um, data sets are credible used in the workshop because they were either I already published or they were published after the workshop and we hope soon to have also paper related with the workshop out. I will present you a case study which is called the uh, Cold River Corridor, which is validated both, both structural and functional and it's represented here in the right. You can see that um, here in the beginning, there were two parts which were quite separated and uh, they were treated individually. But after the workshop, based on the data set, existing data set, we decided to have uh, this uh, surface extended. So it was a direct benefit from the workshop and we've managed to redesign the shape of the corridor after the workshop when we validated the data sets in the field. This corridor was large enough and wide enough to ensure multi-species ecological connectivity. And we had this also from modeling and from the field was having a matrix of uses, including protected areas and other areas with formal designation. It was highly intact and should remain so to ensure maximum quality and does have existing humor bear conflict zone, which should be considered. The ecological corridor was proposed to be included as part of the updated county master plan this year. And we identified directly a need to support, inform, and enable decision that will allow the responsible authorities to include the ecological corridor into the national ecological collectivity legislation. Of course, there were lots of proposals to utilize and improve upon the existing environmental impact assessment process with a new focus on uh, assessing environmental impact in all EA processes from the local to European Commission, wide levels such as for linear infrastructure based on best practices and the IUCN guidance, of course, considering other authoritative institutions, processes and experts. Here you can see that it's a highway planned to bisect the corridor and if the highway were to be built in a straight and alignment as possible through the mountains tunnels and open span bridges should be favored and can serve as one but not the only way for natural features to be protected and serve to minimize the impact on wildlife uh, regarding the non-infrastructure and highway issues, it is important resulted from the workshop to preserve the traditional land uses, which includes forestry, according to national legal provisions, which are very strong to support biodiversity and habitat conservation as they are defined right now to support the game management according to the existing legal provisions, which is also in favor in species conservation and ensuring the long-term species management and conservation. And of course, to, to grazing. It will be extremely useful as a main conclusion, conclusion to prevent new human settlements and associated impacts 
which includes fences, roads and houses, which is a problematic thing in that area because there are many car wildlife accidents already and uh, some uh, new infrastructure which is not authorized is expanding. And of course, there were conclusions which were focusing on um, managing the forests and not only, also the relationships among the stakeholders to maintain a healthy relationship, which includes enhancing partnerships between forest administrations, hunting managers and private landowners to maintain a positive and good practices for timber, watershed and special protection zones, mm -hmm. such as bear hibernation areas and to improve management of recreation, such as enforcing off-roading restrictions and rules. We've learned a few lessons here, a few very important lessons, which was to devise engagement and coordination mechanisms to improve upon the current and available data sets, to consider the number and type of data sets required, and to carefully identify all necessary stakeholders and undertake outreach early and often. The next step will be this, re this report from the workshop, and I hope the next publication will be used across our country to inform productive conversation at all scales. And the conclusions are provided to motivate action beyond our national border, as Romania is increasing a part in this um, international leadership on connectivity conservation, together with the Center for Large Landscape Conservation and the IUCN WCPA Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group and all the partners. And we are looking forward, of course, to continue collaboration and we want to replicate our workshop across the globe in order to our practices to be effectively tailored to specific context in each corner. Another case study was focusing on a corridor which seems that is not functioning anymore and uh, two decades ago was intact and was ensuring the connectivity between a natural park and a national park. Species movement was still confirmed by few direct observation and feces occurrences but now it's a pinch point and is bisected by a very crowded road, unpaved parking and other houses which were expanding into the corridor area. The area, the structural basic for connectivity should be not any smaller than it's currently delineated and might be not longer functionally viable due to increasing traffic and human uh, expanding. Of course, we identify the parking lot, which is serving as the remaining opening to the forest and is the only way species can cross within this corridor. So unfortunately, it's not such a, a happy case because it seems that if we don't act, we can lose areas which could be very important. So this is the reason that we are trying to say that the IUCN guidelines should be used now and we should start now because we can still change something and we can still do something for connectivity. And now we do have the proper tool to act further. Few main conclusion are that the, our recommendation should the, the workshop um, ongoing should consider a wide variety of uses which are existing management and protection with a particular area of connectivity conservation should go into forming stakeholders, coordinating mechanisms and integration of avoidance and mitigation measures in the earlier stages of highway infrastructure. So it is 
the time to act, as I was already saying, and the potential exists in replicating the usage of the IUCN guidance in other nations and regions, because we want to ensure an effective delivery and consistent implementation of ecological connectivity practices. So our institution, together with the Bear Connect Consortium and the Center for Large Landscape Conservation, IUCN Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group, and the overall partners are part of this. And we are all focusing our work into this direction. And we will be happy if others will join our efforts. I am extremely thankful for your attention and let's hope we will see each other very soon again. Hi, I'm Alex from the Norwegian Institute for Nature Research. I would like to present you the results of a large scale assessment on the connectivity among brown bears in Northern Europe. This has been an international project and with that I want to highlight and acknowledge my co-authors from Finland, Sweden and Norway. Please note that all of my slides are numbered on the top left. In case you would like to address any questions in a dedicated Q&A session. Conservation minded management has led to the recovery of large carnivore populations in parts of Europe. In my talk, we are looking at the brown bear populations of Finland, Sweden and Norway. Latest est assessments estimated around 140 bears in Norway, 2,600 bears in Sweden, and about 2,000 bears in Finland. From previous studies, we know that bears from Sweden and Western Norway belong, are belonging to the Scandinavian brown bear population, while bears from Northeastern Norway and Finland are part of the Karelian population. For most of the previous two centuries, brown bears in Europe were heavily persecuted and eventually extirpated from many areas. For example, in the Fenuskanian population, bears were heavily decimated in all three countries, and animals could only be found in a few remote areas, like the north of Sweden, a small area in southern Norway, or near the border to Russia in Finland. Importantly, the hunting led to fragmentation of the once continuous Fenoscanian population into the Scandinavian and Karelian brown bear populations, a situation similar to other large carnivores in the area. As we see from recent data in Sweden from the locations of non-invasive genetic sampling and the density estimates from Finland as examples, both populations have partly bounced back successfully and bears have returned into some areas where they were once present. The process of recovery is further evident by looking at the temporal trajectory of the estimated population sizes in Sweden and in Finland, with roughly about 500 bears in the early 90s to nowadays 2,600 bears in Sweden and 2,000 bears in Finland. And for Norway, the number of identified bears has been rather stable since the annual monitoring started. Although brown bears have staged a successful return across Fenoscandia, several earlier studies reported considerable genetic differentiation among brown bears from, from the Scandinavian and the Karelian population, with no to very low connectivity between both populations as indicated by the line on this map. So considering the successful recovery and re-expansion re of both populations in Finland, Sweden and Norway, the question arose whether Karelian and Scandinavian brown bear populations are separated still. Despite the recovery and quantity of studies assessing connectivity between Scandinavia and Karelia, a comprehensive analysis with continuous sampling has been lacking, especially across the crucial transborder area between northern Sweden and northern Finland. Therefore, the degree of connectivity between these two populations has been poorly understood. In 2018, a project to assess the influx of bears from Finland or the Karelian population into the Scandinavian population was commissioned and funded by the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency 
co-funded by the Norwegian Environment Agency and conducted in close collaboration with the Natural Resources Institute Finland and other partners. We designed a study focusing exclusively on males, the dispersing sex, with continuous sampling across large parts of Fennoscandia. Our objective was to address whether interpopulation and transborder connectivity has been restored by measuring gene flow and to estimate the number of migrants. Our questions specifically were, has the interpopulation and transborder connectivity been restored? And if yes, does the migration surpass the one migrant per generation rule? That specific number is debated, but it is suggested as lower limit on the number of reproducing migrants required to counter negative effects of reduced genetic variation caused, for instance, by isolation in small population, and is also the minimum conservation goal in the current Swedish brown bear management plan. It is important to note that demographic connectivity, like the dispersal of individuals, does not necessarily result in genetic connectivity, meaning the successful reproduction and gene flow. Genetic variation is especially important for small and endangered populations. However, measuring, monitor, measuring or monitoring of connectivity may be beneficial also for recovering populations, for instance, to evaluate the success of conservation and management actions. So when looking at the genetic connectivity or gene flow, we look at the transfer of genetic material or alleles into or out of a population by the movement of individuals. Such an exchange of genetic material reduces the genetic differences between or among populations. Extensive gene flow can result in combining two formerly different populations into one single population with a common gene pool. We used existing genotype data, but also analyzed new, more recent samples. Our research took advantage of the regular and harmonized DNA-based brown bear monitoring in Sweden and Norway. There are more than 35,000 analyzed genetic samples and 6,000 unique individuals stored in the Scandinavian database Rovbase. Also, we used available and new brown bear genotypes from tissue samples of legally harvested and dead bears from northern Sweden, Norway, and Finland. In total, we analyzed 12 autosomal microsatellites and nine Y chromosomal markers of 924 males, sampled during the period of 12 years, representing the upper limit of one brown bear generation. We emphasized including samples in and around the population delineation, namely the transborder area of northern Sweden, the county of Norbotten, and northern Finland, as well as northeastern Norway. But we also included samples from farther away. The genotype data was analyzed to access the genetic structure, gene flow and migration among populations, and the distribution of Y or male lineages across the region. We identified the four known genetic clusters. While most genotypes of the clusters showed large degree of geographical grouping, the distribution also displayed clear spatial overlap, especially within the respective populations of Scandinavia and Karelia. However, as you may see already, we also found bears from Scandinavia in Finland, and, and this is new, bears from Finland with a genetic signature from Karelia in Sweden. When we plot the genetic clusters separately, we see it better. Never before, have we found bears from the cluster of northern Finland and northeastern Norway um, in Scandinavia. Nor have we identified bears from southern Finland in Sweden. In an earlier study, we found a few bears from Sweden and Finland, but here it was quite obvious that bears from Scandinavia are entering Finland and also northeastern Norway. Even though we found these migrants, the result also suggests that the underlying genetic subdivision is still pronounced. Let's look at the male lineages. On the left, we have Y haplotypes present in, Scandin in the Scandinavian population, including two abundant in both populations. And on the right, we have the Y haplotypes present only in the Karelian brown bear population. We identified a total of 28 different haplotypes with 26 haplotypes 
the Karelian population displayed a high diversity, diversity of Y haplotypes, while we found only six haplotypes present in Scandinavia. And two of them were newly identified and were only found in single individuals. The striking difference in haplotype diversity between the Scandinavian and the Karelian population is highly suggestive of differing population histories and recovery processes. For instance, the Finnish population has been and still is supported by a large influx of bears from Russia. We found individuals carrying haplotypes previously detected only in Karelia, now in Scandinavia. One haplotype, for instance, was only previously detected in the Re Russian Republic of Komi, but we found it in a brown bear sample from northwestern Norway. Identifying bears with these different haplotypes are the result of migration. So all results combined, we identified eight migrants for first and for second generation migrants from the Karelian population in Scandinavia. On the other hand, we found 24 migrants, 15 first and nine second generation migrants from Scandinavia in the Karelian population. We combined the estimated Bayesian migration rates with the estimated number of bears in the regions, and in total that led to a recent migration rate of 8% from the Scandinavian population into the Karelian population, which corresponds to about 27 to 35 bears per generation. In the other direction, about 1%, which is roughly four to six bears, migrated recently from the Karelian population into the Scandinavian population. In conclusion, the successful recovery and range, range expansion of both populations led to the restoration of the once lost connectivity, and we identified individuals migrating from Karelia to Scandinavia for the first time. Both populations are not isolated from each other, and the migration exceeds the one migrant per generation rule. Nonetheless, the underlying population structure is pronounced still. Connectivity and gene flow were asymmetric, with a higher immigration rate from individuals from Scandinavia to Karelia than in the opposite direction. The reason for this asymmetric migration remains underexplored and is likely related to varying brown bear densities in Scandinavia and Karelia, but also likely caused by the different recovery histories of both populations. The results also show that conservation-driven management can lead to population recovery and restoration of connectivity of fragmented brown bear populations. But the monitoring should continue to, continue to increase our knowledge on that matter. By aligning monitoring between neighboring countries and focused sampling on the dispersing sets, we were able to assess gene flow across, across different, but importantly, re relevant large spatial scales. And nonetheless, harmonized transborder monitoring is crucial to, to do this and to understand the connectivity also in recovering and continuous populations. This is a result, uh, the results of the study have been published in a detailed report and also with some additional analysis in a scientific paper in biological conservation. This has been an incredibly interesting and also fun project to work with. And I would like to thank all of my, uh, all the collaborators and supporting staff of the different institutions involved. And thank you for your attention. Hi, everyone. My name is Brooke, and today I'll be talking to you about sea ice fragmentation and polar bear migratory movement. Habitat fragmentation is the separation of continuous habitat into smaller discontinuous patches. And this often occurs with loss of habitat. Generally, reduced patch size will increase the isolation of those patches, and highly fragmented landscape, landscapes often mean more costly movement for animals, as they must expend more time, energy, or risk to move between these patches. Sea ice is one of many habitats that experience fragmentation, although a little bit different from terrestrial habitat. It has ice flows, that can fragment from thaw or from drift. 
Um, this fragmentation most notably occurs during the breakup period, which in regions with annual ice is when the ice will melt and break up as we move into the ice-free season. Overall, sea ice is both spatially and temporally variable. It has spatially variable because we have these ice flows or ice pans that are constantly moving from drift and constantly experiencing some level of freeze and thaw. It's also temporally variable because we have a cyclic sea ice cycle, right? We have a sea ice season and then commonly an ice free season. And in between there, we have a breakup period. Polar bears are one of many animals that make, make sea ice their primary home. They will live on the ice whenever they can. They'll travel across the ice. They find mates and also mate on the ice, as well as access their preferred prey, ring seals and bearded seals on the ice. So of course then, sea ice phenology will influence their access to those prey, their access to mates and the timing of migration. Many polar bear populations, though not all, will migrate off of the ice onto land during that breakup period while they'll spend the ice-free season on land fasting. Moving back to fragmentation, um, patch-based metrics are commonly used to quantify habitat fragmentation. Um, this works really well in terrestrial habitats where distinct patch types can be easily identified. Sea ice though, um, you can see here, even with this figure, it's showing um, habitat concentration. And without knowing too much, you can already tell there's not really distinct patches, kind of more like gradients. So spatial autocorrelation actually has the potential to kind of describe habitats of this nature that don't have distinct patches, uh, where positive autocorrelation um, could be used to describe similar local habitats and negative autocorrelation um, for dissimilar habitats. So that would be a good way to describe the spatial variation of sea ice. But what about that temporal variation I was talking about? One way to address this would be the variation in spatial, spatial autocorrelation over time. And we actually did just that. Um, last year, we came up with spatial autocorrelation standard deviation or SASD. Uh, this metric was compared to uh, more commonly used patch-based metrics, and we found that it was more effective for predicting the effect of habitat fragmentation on polar bear movement. So this map is kind of just what one SASD map output would look like. Um, this is just for a certain time period. Um, and this red area is the most variable region on the map. You can see from the standard deviation scale. And I will point out that these really highly variable locations are actually the ice patches that remain the longest in the habitat um, because you kind of get a lot of variability from the melting of the ice flow and as well as the drift of these smaller ice patches. And these kind of not very uh, variable regions at all are, this is just like open water that kind of stayed the same the entire time. So the objective of this study was to use this new SASD metric. Um, we wanted to examine the interactions between sea ice fragmenta fragmentation and characteristics of polar bear movement. More specifically, can SASD explain variation in polar bear migration? The population we're focusing on is the Western Hudson Bay polar bear population. This is one of those polar, polar bear populations that migrates onto land. Um, and fasts for the ice-free season. And this population is actually pr predicted to struggle to persist after 2050 due to sea ice decline. We used telemetry data from 39 adult female polar bears that were collared between 2012 and 2017. Um, the GPS collars gave us locations about every four hours. And the study area you see outlined here is a 100% minimum convex polygon which is kind of just a line around all of our locations. This is our study area. We focused on the breakup period because like I said, this is the region of most habitat fragmentation of sea ice. The breakup period here was May 2nd to July 23rd, and we separated it into early and late breakup where early breakup is um, a 100% to 50% sea ice concentration of the entire study area and late breakup was 50% to 0% sea ice concentration for the whole study area. 
CA's concentration itself were, uh, were six and a quarter by six and a quarter kilometer pixels um, that were assigned um, a percentage of coverage value with or a percentage of concentration value in each pixel. And SASD, uh, the spatial autocorrelation metric we use is Geary C, which is a metric focused on dissimilarity. So more dissimilar regions had higher values. And the value assigned to each pixel was done using a five by five local pixel moving window. Once we had a Geary C value for each pixel for each day, we kind of took all the days in early breakup and stacked them and quantified the variation of each pixel over that time period and did the exact same thing for late breakup. So we ended up with two SASD maps for each year. The movement analysis, we put all the polar bear locations onto our SASD maps and extracted SASD at each location. Then for each path, we calculated mean SASD. We also calculated path tortuosity for each individual. So that's just the curviness of the path using a straightness index where one was straight and it approached zero as the path became more curvy. We also quantified ordinal date on land. That was just the first day the bear came onto land. And we also wanted to see if reproductive status had any effect. So we looked at the presence and age of accompanying cubs. Um, it's important to note that reproductive status is uncertain past the year of handling. So that sample size was a bit smaller. You should also note that mean SASD and straightness index were both log transformed to improve the normality of residuals. So from here on out, those will be log transformed. The test that we did, we just did some pretty straightforward linear models. Again, early and late breakup are separate. We compared mean SASD and straightness index for each path, mean SASD and date on land for each individual. And um, we tested nonlinearity just with some quadratic functions. We also did a Kruskal Wallace non-parametric test for reproductive status. So we compared the mean SASD for each, each individual with cubs of the year, yearlings, two-year-olds, and without cubs. So let's talk about some results. Uh, right off the bat, I can tell you reproductive status had absolutely no effect. Uh, so we can move right on from there. Everybody was about the same. Uh, in early breakup, so these two graphs are early breakup, and let's just orient you very quickly. These x-axis is SASD, so this is increasing variability in sea ice. Um, this one is straightness index, so with lower values, you have a curvier path. And this is just the day of the year the bear uh, came onto land, and we can see there's no relationships in early breakup. Late breakup, though, uh, we can see with increasing SASD, bears' paths were curvier or more tortuous. And with increasing SASD of a path, the bear actually came onto land later, although this relationship was nonlinear. And we'll kind of talk about why in a little bit. Overall, what does this mean? Well, variation in migratory movement is due, at least in part, to regional and temporal variation in sea ice. And this pattern is, of course, much more obvious in the latter half of breakup. When we look at tortuosity, um, paths that had low SASD or low variability in sea ice uh, kind of allowed more direct trajectories or less tortuous paths that makes sense. Um, paths that had higher SASD, um, it's thought that maybe the bears were changing direction to avoid swimming, right? Bears do travel across the sea ice predominantly on foot. They can swim quite well, but swimming can increase energy expenditure, which would reduce the efficiency of their movement. And for a bear that's trying to put on a lot of fat for a pretty long fasting period, you can see how that wouldn't be ideal. Now, if we look at date on land, Hopefully you'll remember, I said that the regions of highest SASD were those longest persisting patches. So it could be bears that were moving in higher SASD regions were just delaying coming onto land for more access to hunting. But the non-linearity of that, that relationship kind of suggests that, you know, bears are constrained no matter how variable a patch they are or how variable of land, how variable of ice they're moving through. Um, they're, they have to kind of be forced onto land eventually just from lack of ice at the end of breakup. 
Overall, um, SASD, this kind of application is great for its simplicity, right? Pretty straightforward models, pretty straightforward results. Kind of, it's great to show us some simple patterns, um, which also lends it pretty good to some wider applications, right? If we look at how um, other animals, uh, other species movements kind of uh, line up with variable SASD, we can get a broader understanding of not only Arctic ecosystems in general, but also how many of these species uh, might be affected by variability in sea ice as climate change really continues to change sea ice. Um, so, right, we can look at singular species and get better understandings, but also um, understanding how variability of sea ice affects different species could give us a good idea of the interactions between those species. Finally, SASD is great because it's easily customizable, right? So you can very easily change both the um, temporal and spatial scale of SASD, which makes it great to customize to pretty much any application you would want. So thank you all for listening to me today. I would really like to thank my co-authors, of course, and I would like to thank all of the incredible funders that help make research like this happen. Uh, this paper was recently published in MEPS, so if you want to read a little bit more, get a few more details, uh, you can feel free to check that out there. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk on resource selection in blackberries. Today, I'm just going to start by talking broadly about how the field of ecology is predominantly concerned with two major concepts. One, how many animals are there? And two, where are they located? These concepts are related, and there are a variety of factors that influence the number of animals and how they move. For example, animals must move to safe places away from perceived risks such as predators or people, and find food resources if they are to survive and reproduce. We also know that their decisions to move can depend on the land cover types they encounter and the way those land cover patches are, at, are arranged on the landscape. And ecologists have done a great job of documenting how populations of animals change and move, from quantifying the number of hares and lynx through their decade-long iconic cycles to tracking the wildebeest through their long migrations. However, we are not yet well acquainted with the intricate understanding of individuals within those populations. Animals can be highly plastic in their responses to their environment, and we know that individuals within a population may not be experiencing the same influences. For example, spatial placement may matter, with individuals located near cities thinking about the impact of those cities more often than individuals living in more remote locations. Additionally, Animals may also be driven by different influences based on where they are within their own life histories. As individuals are the building blocks of animal populations, understanding their choices can help give meaning to population level patterns, and this information can directly influence management choices. So then this leads us to the question of what drives an individual's landscape choices, and are these choices influenced by an individual's spatial placement on the landscape or characteristics such as age, sex, or reproductive status? We examine these questions using the American black bear. The great thing about this species is that we already have a lot of information on variables which impact bear populations. However, we haven't yet examined those ideas in terms of what drives individuals within any given population. To answer our questions, we collected GPS data on black bears captured in the Ozarks of South Central Missouri. This is a recolonizing population derived from a small remnant population in Missouri and bears which were reintroduced into Arkansas. It has grown to be between 540 to 840 individuals since 2012, and at current growth rates, the population is expected to double every decade. From 2011 to 2018, Staff in the Missouri Department of Conservation captured and GPS collared bears in the southern third of the state. MDC staff also tracked and collared bears and replaced collars during annual den checks, ensuring continuous data collection, which gave 171 bear years of information, as many individuals had multiple years of data. After data was collected, we removed locations that were clearly incorrect, locations that equated to distances not traversable by a bear over a 2.5 hour period, and denning periods from the data set. This left us with just over 174,000 fixes over an eight-year period to work with within our analyses. 
On top of the GPS data, the MDC also sexed and aged bears and tracked the reproductive status of females through time. Initial visual inspection of movement data showed us that these black bears were very plastic in their annual movements, with some bears being very phylopatric to a specific area, while other bears wandered all year long. These patterns were also plastic from year to year. This was the first indication that individuals within the population were driven by different influences, and it also presented an analytical challenge as we needed to account for these movement patterns within our models of bear landscape choice. To account for these movement patterns, we used integrated step selection analysis. This analysis works with two aspects of animal movement. First, step lengths, which is a straight line distance between two successive fixes, and second, turn angles, which is the angular deviation between the original heading on the first step and the new heading on a successive, successive step. This analysis allows for us to compare what is um, used at a given location to randomly generated locations around that used point. These random locations are chosen based on the steps and turn angles possible um, based on an animal, individual's own movement patterns, which means these models account for each bear's movement pattern as it makes choices across the landscape. For each used and random location, we then extracted information related to each of our hypothetical drivers on bear choices. First, we hypothesized that bear choices may be driven by risk avoidance, and so our first model included distance to roads and human density. In this scenario, we predicted that bears would select greater distances from roads and lower human densities, and that this difference would be greatest during the day when humans were active. Our second hypothesis was that bear choices may be driven by food abundance, and so our second model included a vegetation productivity index and accounted for possible vegetation choices by season. We predicted that bears would select areas of greater productivity and that they would mainly select for shrubs and forests. We also hypothesized that bear choices may be driven by the presence of contiguous vegetation. Therefore, our third model included a landscape fragmentation index and vegetation type, and we predicted that bears would select contiguous forests. Finally, we hypothesized that bear choices may be driven by the presence of features which would facilitate movement. Therefore, our final model included a patch aggregation index and distance to streams as riparian zones facilitate carnivore movement. We predicted that bears would select areas with greater patch aggregation and smaller distances to streams. We then ran each bear year of information through the set of candidate competing models, which reflected our hypothetical drivers of bear movement. So on to our first question, into what drives an individual's, individual's landscape choices. When we tally the top models across bear years, the first thing we can see is that the contiguous landscape model has the most support across 71 bear years of data. However, risk avoidance and food abundance also had strong support across 52 and 49 bear years respectively. On top of that, while bear choices were consistent within a year, most individuals were flexible in their selection patterns and switched between drivers from year to year. For example, some bears switched between a risk avoidance focus to a food abundance focus and vice versa. So what is important in our top models? For the next few slides, I'm gonna show you two things. For continuous variables, I'm gonna show you the relative strength of selection. In these cases, greater deviations from zero indicate stronger selection, and the positive or negative portion of that uh, variable is simply reflective of the direction of the relationship. When we have categorical variables, I'm gonna show you the selection coefficient. In those cases, greater positive deviations from one indicate stronger selection, while numbers below one indicate avoidance. So for bear years where the top model was contiguous landscapes, we see that bears do indeed select for areas with lower indices of fragmentation, and they do like forest cover, but more so shrubs, and they avoid grasslands. For bear years where the top model was risk avoidance, we see that bears select greater distances from roads and lower human densities. Interesting that this disparity was actually greater at twilight or at night um, and not during the daytime. For barriers where the top model was food abundance, we see that bears selected areas of greater productivity. We also see bear vegetation choices were seasonal with forests um, selected for in the spring, shrubs and forests selected in the summer, and there are no preferences in the fall. 
We also see that, that grasslands were avoided year round. So the next question is then, are these choices influenced by an individual spatial placement or characteristics such as age, sex, or reproductive status? We see selection drivers were not related to where's were located on the landscape. As we saw, 63.5% of home range overlap um, between bears using different drivers. These drivers, however, did impact home range size, with bears avoiding risk having the smallest home ranges, while bears focused on food resources having the largest ones. Selection drivers were also related to sex, age, and level of maternal care, female spaced. Males were mainly driven by contiguous forests and food resources, while females were mainly driven by contiguous forests and risk avoidance. For males, those that were focused on food resources were younger than those in contiguous forests. And for females, risk avoidance and use of contiguous forests was important when they had cubs, and there was no particular pattern to what drove them when they had yearlings. So why does all this matter? Well, now that we have a better understanding of the factors which influence individuals within this population, we can build upon that information. For example, we can take those important variables we identified and feed them into a model which maps fine scale habitat suitability for our bear population. This map can be used to inform a variety of management decisions um, related to bear population management and also habitat management and conservation. We can also use a suitability map in some next steps. For example, we can pair our suitability map with our other movement analyses, which can help us potentially identify landscape relationships, which promote bear interactions with urban areas in the hopes that we can focus outreach and management efforts in those areas at the as the bear population continues to expand. And with that, I would like to thank this, all the state biologists and technicians at the Missouri Department of Conservation for putting in the many hours needed to gather all this information, along with our partners in New York whose efforts helped lay the foundation for, for this work, along with all our funding partners. And with that, I will be happy to take questions. So yeah, welcome everybody. My name is uh, Ryan Wilson. Um, I'm the moderate, moderator for this uh, connectivity session today, and it's the moderated Q&A type of session where there won't be any live presentations, but the presenters uh, will you know, be open for questions and discussions about their uh, presentations that hopefully you all have watched uh, prior to this morning. Um, so today's uh, session is sponsored by the Vital Ground Foundation. And basically, I think the way that we'll structure it is each participant or each speaker will get about 10 minutes to um, answer questions from, um, from the audience, I guess we'll call it. And there's two ways to, to ask your question. You can either um, raise your hand by um, going down to the bottom of your screen and, and clicking on the reactions button. And there'll be um, like a raise hand button. So you can click that, which will indicate that you wanna ask your question verbally and we'll unmute you um, to do that. Or you can um, enter your question in the chat box that everybody can see. And you can make sure you have the chat box open by again, down on the bottom of your screen, you'll um, see the a chat button and that'll open it up um, to the right. So, um, <clears throat> so today we have, I believe, I think we're missing one of the speakers. Um, and, and unless he shows up, I think we're, we have four currently. So we have uh, Ankuta Fedorka. She's with the Nas National Institute for Research and Development in Forestry in Romania. We have Alexander Kopatz. He's a researcher at the Norwegian Institute for Nature Research in Trondheim, Norway. We have Brooke Biddlecum from the University of Manitoba and Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And then we have uh, Melanie Boudreaux from Mississippi State University. So I think we'll start this morning. Well, this morning for me, I think we're all around the world. So this evening, this afternoon, um, middle of the night. Uh, we'll start with 
uh, and Kuta and in her talk, um, which was titled How to Create a Safety Network for Nature, Connectivity, um, Conservation for the Jewel of Europe. So um, I guess I'll just kind of maybe start off the, the, the Q&A with her and um, and I just, let's see, make sure she gets, yeah, she's unmuted, that's good. <clears throat> so I'm just curious, I thought that was a really interesting talk and and I guess I hadn't realized, you know, how how intact the landscape still is in Romania. Um, but you talked about, you know, some of those areas where maybe the corridors um, have been, um, yeah, not conserved as much as you wanted to through time. So have you observed at those places, have you observed reductions in predator movements? Um, where those corridors have been breached versus those areas where they've been preserved through time? Yeah, there are areas that they've been breached and also we do have an increase in uh, human wildlife conflicts because it's a kind of bottleneck and the uh, wildlife is pushed outside the network and they are creating problems in the area. So this is the reason that we are trying to act at least at uh, this time before being too late. Happily, we are in a fortunate situation that we can still do something because the linear infrastructure is not yet there. So we do have the chance to, to do it in a, in a proper way. And by using the, the IUCN guidelines, focusing on ecological networks and ecological corridors, for sure, we will be able to have a, a good uh, a good tool to, to so it's cutting off yeah yep sorry about that um yeah we heard you oh. Institutions in our country into that direction and to implement it into. All right. Yes, I think we. Sorry about that. Do you hear me now? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. It's like cutting in and out about, uh, I think, about halfway through it kind of slowed down. I will stop my video. Maybe we'll, we'll work better. Okay. Yeah, it's a little bit better, but uh, we'll, yeah. Cool. Do you yeah. hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I, I think hopefully that Connection. resolves some of it. Um, does so? Does anybody in the in the audience have uh, questions for Ankuta? All right, I have I have another one then. So. How, <clears throat> how receptive is the Roma the Romanian government to implementing the results of, of kind of the impressive amount of work that you and your team have have done? So fortunately, we are in the good uh, good direction. This I was saying when the the connection was interrupted, that we formed actually a connectivity conservation specialist group, which is nearly to be approved at the ministry level. And we are working into building the procedures on designing the ecological network and ecological corridors. And uh, even more, we are having success at the regional level where we are involved into strategical planning of infrastructure. And we are in the first line when um, they are uh, actually thinking to, to do something into that direction. Okay. So uh, the, the impact of the workshop was tremendous, at least at the regional level. And I can say that it's on the good path at the governmental level. Oh, that's great. Looks like we have a question from Tabitha. Oh, I just, yep, there you go. Hi, um, I just was wondering, um, you talked a little bit about functional connectivity and sort of uh, 
illustrating also that the happening and could you just a little bit on what you all did to illustrate that? Uh, we've moved a bit the approach to multiple species and we are using genetics to validate and we have uh, uh, genetic data sets uh, from time series. So we are working into, into improving the, the resolution right now, but we are working with the genetic data sets if I understood the, the question well. Yeah, and I guess are, are just showing that the animals are indeed moving across at this point. I'm sorry, I've missed the, the second part. I was just asking, are you, are you, you have shown that the animals are moving across at this point with the genetics? Yeah, yeah, we've, we've confirmed with time series that species are moving across and the gene flow, it's, it's ongoing. And uh, beside this, we do have also GPS telemetry data sets confirming this for multiple species. Excellent, thanks. Thank you. All right, do we have any other audience questions? All right, I'll throw out another one then if we... Everybody's raising their hand. Um, so, yeah, what do you think is uh, are the best analytical tools for planning and identification of regions important for um, connectivity of a variety of, of wildlife species? I think it needs to be a sum of them because you cannot use the, just one approach for sure. What we've did um, and we, we are still doing is that we've used various approaches, such as least cost path, circuit scape, and then going through landscape genetics, which gives an extremely uh, improved resolution. And now we are working also to see the wildlife vehicle collision hotspots, and then to come up with the Maxent models and at the end, at multi-species level, we are seeing that the patterns are, are quite the same. So by using multiple methods, we are trying to identify uh, places which are confirmed by most of them. Okay. It's always nice to see <clears throat> multiple methods kind of give you similar results and gives <laughs> you some confidence in what you've done. So that's good. Um, so I think we have about yeah two to three more minutes for Ankuta. Does anybody else have any questions or should or uh, we can move on if there isn't? What I wanted to say and, and to add to this is that even if you have the best analytical tools and whatever best results, now we do have the perfect tool to move forward. So we do have the IUCN guidelines focusing on, on connectivity and ecological networks and, and corridors, and we can move our results and transfer them further in order to implement, it, to implement them. Because if we are staying just at the scientific level, we will ne never be able to deliver something credible to governments the NGOs and other bodies who can, can deliver the, the message further and to ensure monitoring and management of the networks and the ecological corridors. So now we do have the tools and it's working and could be replicated. What we did, it could be easily replicated across the globe. Great. All right, well, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for yeah, fielding those questions and, and yeah, the interesting presentation and stuff. Uh, and with that. So I think we'll move on now, just to keep on schedule. Um, next, uh, the next uh, presenter will be Alexander Kopatz and, and his uh, presentation was titled Restoration of Transporter Connectivity Between Two Large Bear, or Large Brown Bear Populations. Um, I don't know, Alexander, if you, yeah, wanted to say anything, or we'll just uh, yeah open it up to the uh, to the group if they have any questions. 
I'll give them a second. Open. Actually, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, just open up for the questions. I think I okay. try to summarize it and we can use the time for something okay. else, I guess. So I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll kick it off again too, just until other people have a chance. Um, so are there, um, let's see, yeah, are there concerns about the future connectivity of the population in that area with you know, road development or other sort of infrastructure or activities? And, and what's currently being done to maintain that connectivity um, in, that, in that region? Yeah, the last question I can reply with no. I mean, there's not really much going on, at least not that I'm aware of. I mean, there are of course infrastructure projects planned, but it's only what I read in the news. I mean, that they would like to build uh, railways or roads up there within terms of exploration of the Arctic. But um, I think it's more like a longer standing problem with a lack of connectivity since, since the bears were wiped out from these regions or partly from these regions. Okay. So they have been uh, coming back a bit, but still, I think it's more like an anthropogenic influence, which is kind of <sighs> hindering the bears to, to roam through these areas. Gotcha. Okay. So it looks like we have yeah, a question from Trishna. So let's start with her. Yeah. Am I on? Yes. Uh, hey, Alex, great talk. Um, I had Hi, Trisha. two questions, one kind of more, I don't know, baseline, one very specific. Um, the general question is, so you talk about this reestablishing or restoring connectivity between um, this, this, these northern populations. Uh, what, like, is there a baseline restoration level that would be when you say we achieved it or like, is there a baseline gene flow level that you're aiming for, or what is the criteria? Yes, there? It's, it's a very good question. I think we could probably debate uh, several hours on that. I mean, uh, one of the baseline was, was this one migrant per generation rule. This is where we were looking for. So if this is achieved, we kind of would say, okay, this has achieved a certain level. But again, this is also kind of disputed in depending on the scenario. But I think in, in the specific scenario with the brown bears in Northern Europe, I think we are on a good path. I mean, the populations are very strong. And the, now the Finnish expansion front is arriving at Scandinavia. Nonetheless, I think we st should continue to, to, to look what is actually happening and how it's developing over the next, let's say, I mean, let's say brown bear generation, 10 to 12 years. So, but uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, I was just like, I was just wondering if there was like a really historic benchmark or some museum, something done. Um, no, I mean, it, it's, it based, like that's not it's based partly also on, on older literature, like um, older data was, was published or what has been known of older populations and recovery and refugia zones, but it's not really much we know in. But I think um, we might go dig deeper into it if we analyze historical data mm -hmm. of museums and, and, uh, and older shot bears. We probably could uh, get more insights. It has been done partly in Scandinavia already. So, but it shows clearly that a lot of lineages, like paternally and maternally, uh, got extinct. So. Okay. Okay. Um, and um, I don't know if this is the right time to ask it, but I had a very specific question. <laughs> like you had uh, some slides uh, number I have written as fourteen to sixteen. And you mm. had squares and circles, and I was wondering what those squares and circles meant. Uh, you mean probably you're referring to the assignment. Um, this was, uh, I didn't um, um, pinpoint to do that, but if you look at the publication, it, it refers to the, to the um, um, level of assignment, the Q value and structure. So most, ah, of, most okay. of the bears were clearly assigned with about 70 up to 80, over 80% of assignment values. And there were like a small percentage, if I remember correctly, maybe 7%, which has the like admixtured uh, uh, genotypes or signatures. Okay, perfect. Hmm. Thanks. All yeah, right. thank you. We have a couple more questions. We'll go to uh, Marta. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Hi, Alex. Thanks for your talk. Um, Hi. I was just wondering in, in this um, study, you focused on um, male connectivity 
And I was just wondering if you have information also for the female part um, between, be between the populations in that area. And if, if you have information or if you know, if you have information, so if you, if you know if, if there are barriers specific for that, to that, and if there is, if the management is accounting uh, for both females and males connectivity. I would say the last question, not really, and I don't really have information right at hand. I mean, we have these previous studies where we have males and females, but we had this patchy sampling and, um, but we never really separated males uh, to females to look at it because it's always an issue to get a, a, a strong sample size for statistics. But here specifically, we focused on males to really look, is there gene flow or not? Because a purely logistic problem right. and challenge. So um, no, actually not. But we know that there are female or concentration areas or areas with higher density of bears, which is also correspond, correspond to areas with higher density of females. But this is something maybe to 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 start with. Uh, I would start there probably with uh, when looking at the data. But it's anyway a bit challenging to really get also female data from these northern areas and more remote areas. I mean, it's population density of humans is very low. Uh, there's some hunting going on, but uh, not all of the samples are delivered, especially from the from the Finnish part. But it's uh, it's really hard to get uh, female samples from that area. Okay, but it's like so. It, it, it's those areas are not females' core areas. Are more like dispersing er, areas. Is that why, or it's more for the um, for the environmental context? You're saying with. Um, I mean, there's some really remote areas where we don't really know what is going on in this, like this Anayoka, Lemanyoki area, which is like in the north, center north of the border area between Norway and Finland. I mean, it's, it's very hard to access. It's very elaborate to get into when we have some samples from that area, but prob probably not enough. So yeah, it's a sampling thing mainly, you think? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Probably densities are very, very, for sure, for like the, 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 the Finnish area of the reindeer husbandry area is notoriously low, has a low density of brown bears. So females who enter this area are actually also quite, uh, also shot quite easily. So because of um, special legislation for brown bear removal, so. Okay, thanks. Right. Thanks, Marta. All right, uh, we'll go to Michael. Proctor, we might have one time for one more question after this. Uh, we'll see, but okay. Take the next one. Yeah. Uh, hi, Alexander, I listened to your talk this morning. I, hopefully nobody's asked this question or it's not off base, but I noticed there was two, you know, it's difficult to decide what that threshold is, one, one migrant per generation. What, and I think that I know the answer to your question, but were you able to measure any increase in the number of alleles or heterozygosity or anything in the population that had sort of low heterozygosity? I, I think I recall they had differential heterozygosity. We measured it in a population amazingly, but it was very small. And I imagine your populations are too big to know the difference, but that's actually the real, uh, real measure of the, the improvement in genetic diversity or whatever it might be. Did you give that a whirl or? No, no, I, I totally agree with you. But the challenge is again, like uh, referring to Marta's question is the sample sizes. So we pulled across like this uh, upper limit of Ron Brauma generation to actually have sufficient sample sizes in some areas like Northern Finland, where it's really, really hard to get uh, good sample coverage. So no, we haven't looked at it. We looked at, of course, like uh, temporal developments of immigration. There is some, but it's not really clear because um, we need just more data to, to look at it. Yeah, well, my impression is your work, you had a ton of data. I was pretty impressed, but I, I understand <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're dealing with some big areas. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mike. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Let me... All right, we'll go to the... Tabitha. Hey, Alex. Um, Hi, Tabitha. Hear you. Um, I, so I don't know. If, uh, my original question was actually. 
related to what Michael asked about. And there's a cool poster, if you guys want to check that out, um, that I saw last night that's in the poster session. But I also, for another question I had for you, Alex, was you briefly mentioned sort of the population, um, the role of the increasing population size and potentially uh, increasing that those movements. And I'm just wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. And do you think specifically, I guess, do you think that uh, that will continue to happen given all of the other policies in place? I mean, this has been observed before more locally or nationally in this uh, both countries. Now, I mean, demographic has gone, gone up. I mean, distribution has changed, like the monitoring data has shown. So, uh, and we, we saw genetically, like locally also, like uh, within Finland and also partly in Sweden. Um, if it's likely to continue, I mean, it depends really how it's managed in the future. I mean, if the aim is of course to keep the population stable, we have to see what's what's uh, going on in the future. I mean, it's a bit really hard to predict, I would say. But I think, um, again, uh, like, a, like a reply to an earlier question, I think it doesn't look too bad, I would say, so. All right. <clears throat> well, thanks, Alexander and um, uh, Tabitha for that question. Well, if we have time, I, there was one that came in through the chat and if there's time towards the end uh, of the session. Great. We'll We'll come back to that. So, Good. thanks. Uh huh. All right. Um, so the yeah. So the next um, presenter is Brooke Biddlecombe, and um, her talk was titled uh, "Effects of Sea Ice Fragmentation on Polar Bear Migratory Movements in Hudson Bay." Um, so Brooke, let's see. Get you to unmute. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll just start off again with a question and give people a chance. Oh, actually, I'll let Tabitha go first. She's got her hand raised again. Let me, there we go. Okay. We're, we're getting the system down now. <laughs> um, really nice presentation. Um, I was curious, um, uh, you talked a little about, you said you used uh, Gary C as the spatial autocorrelation metric. And I was just wondering whether you played around with other metrics or um, if that, you tried that first and it worked well, so you went with it. <laughs> um, so I kind of decided on using Gary C pretty early on, um, just because after sort of doing like a general review of a bunch of different spatial autocorrelation metrics. I liked that Geary C really focused on dissimilarity. And I knew that was kind of what we were focused on when we were thinking about looking at the variation and how the concentrations were different in these local areas. Um, so honestly, I only used Geary C um, just because right off the bat, I figured it would be the best fit. Great. I have another question if nobody else does. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, let's see. I was wondering um, about whether, um, oh, where, where did it go? Uh, wondering about how um, this technique, I mean, you talked a little bit in your talk about how you could see it applying to other species in the Arctic. But it, it kind of struck me that it's really sort of adapt, has potential for any temporally changing landscape. Um, and I was just wondering if you had thought about that much. And if so, if you could expand on that. Um, your question cut out a little bit because my internet is being rude today. But um, I'm thinking you were asking if I thought about applying SASD to landscapes that aren't necessarily sea ice is that correct yeah other temporarily changing landscapes. yeah um so i did talk about this a little bit with uh, one of my collaborators aaron bain um, because he actually works on birds so he thought it might be interesting to look at um like grasslands um or something like that um, we haven't actually done any work on that, but I think there definitely is the uh, 
potential for it to work on a habitat that's not quite as um I, I would say quite as quick changing as sea ice, right? Because there's a whole lot of movement going on on sea ice. Um, and what's nice about this um, SASD metric is, like I said in my talk, you can really change um, the spatial and temporal scale. So to apply it to like a terrestrial habitat that maybe still changes fairly rapidly, but at a bit of a longer scale, um, the metric is really adaptable to that. So I think there's definitely the opportunity but um, now I'm kind of focusing more on marine mammals. So we've kind of just been sticking with sea ice. Yeah, really innovative approach. Thanks so much for sharing. Thank you. So I, I had a kind of a uh, relatively <clears throat> simple methodological question. So you used a, a five by five window for kind of mm -hmm. estimating that Gary C. And so that I guess with the the raster that you're using is like a 31 kilometer essentially by 31 kilometer uh, box. So I'm just curious what, yeah, what was, why did you choose that as your um, distance to kind of measure things? Yeah, so we chose that um, basically as close as we could get to um, the average sort of step length of a bear in one day. Um, and that it, really the better fit would have been a four by four, but the applying Geary C required a central pixel. So we just kind of kicked it up to a five by five. Okay, cool. All right, anyone else got questions before I dive into another? Oh, okay, good. Someone got uh, Andre. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, let's try. Um, so, nice presentation. Um, I just want to ask a question uh, regarding the, the eyes formation. So, I've seen that you have done previous work in 2020 on uh, uh, more. Um, like a stat based uh, movement rather than trajectory based. And I was wondering if you have information of, of more like fine tune uh, moving decisions uh, with the current ACE condition. So basically, if animals uh, are more, have more straight movement when ice is less fragmented, so more on a stat based rather than a than a trajectory base, if you have any any information on that. And uh, that's related also with the question, which is the resolution of your ice formation? Is that uh, daily or is like weekly? And yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I'll start with the um, ice data we used is daily. Uh, and um, con your question concerning steps. So kind of the sister paper to this one that I presented was, uh, like you said, the one that uses an integrated step selection function to basically to see if SASD could be useful. Um, and we found in that paper that um, higher SASD um, regions bears had uh, basically like more like back and forth turning angles instead of kind of a more um, continuous trajectory. So with the individual steps, yeah, we found that um, there was sort of greater turning angle associated with um, steps on higher SASD. Uh, and yeah, that the kind of the big finding of that paper was that the variability in sea ice uh, had the biggest effect on turning angle. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you very much. No problem. All right, um, <clears throat> we have time for a couple more questions if anybody's got one. All right, here we go. I'm going to throw one out. So um, 
this is, I mean, so it's related to the, the topic of connectivity and things like that, but maybe not as uh, focused on, on your precise research. But so, you know, unlike a lot of the other presenters in this session where land management decisions might help keep movement corridors around into the future, sea ice is, isn't something that we can actively manage. Um, so aside from efforts to slow climate change, which we all know is a really easy thing to do, kidding. <laughs> um, uh, what else, you know, do you think wildlife managers, you know, can do to ensure that polar bears are able to access seasonally important areas without like detrimental increases to energetic costs, uh, movement and stuff? Oh, um, that's a small question. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's really hard to um, really make any like short term. Um, I guess in my head, I would think of them as like band-aid fixes to the greater problem that is climate change, um, especially for sea ice, right? Like we can't like add artificial ice flows or something like the logistics just don't make sense. Um, so honestly, in for polar bears, it's kind of bleak because it's like, if we can't get a handle on climate change, like their migratory pathways are, they're not gone per se, but the timing of migration is gonna change so much that their fasting period is gonna be so much longer. Um, and of course that kind of leads to this whole, whole cascade effect of basically bad news, right? Longer fasting, shorter hunting periods on the ice and all of that. And yeah, I don't know if there's any sort of short-term solutions to that, I guess for the bears. Um, some bears, uh, not in Hudson Bay, of course, but some populations do sort of follow the ice further up north instead of coming onto land. But as our sea ice concentration continues to shrink, right, following the ice up north isn't that great either because it's going over that really unproductive Arctic basin. And they can't really get food anyway. So it's kind of bleak. Uh, I don't really know if I can answer yeah. your question. No, that's a good answer. That's, that's my assessment too. I was hoping you had a more optimistic view than, <laughs> than I do currently. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think, yeah, I think we'll, th yeah, thank you for answering your questions. And uh, yeah, really interesting talk and uh, presentation. Um, so yeah, if we have more. I think we'll have some time towards the end for some additional questions, but uh, we'll move on now to uh, Melanie Boudreau, who's with Mississippi State University, and her talk was titled Characterizing Drivers of Fine-Scale Resource Selection in a Recolonizing Black Bear Population. Um, so we'll kick it off. Uh, Tabitha seems to always get her hand up really quick, so... She's got a question, but otherwise I will take a stab. No one's coming in quick. Um, so <clears throat> I always, you know, personally kind of appreciate research that takes into account um, variability and choices and preferences among, you know, animal, individual animals in a population. I think that is often ignored. So, so I like to see that in your research, but I guess I'm curious why you decided to only focus on models with one set of drivers rather than models with multiple sets of drivers um, to kind of get at yeah what what the core decision uh, decisions being made by those bears were. That's a good question. Um, I guess we just decided to test um, different sorts of theories related to like species ecology. So, you know, is, is risk driving decisions, is food driving decisions. You could run like a global model, I suppose, with all of those drivers to see if, if multiple drivers are coming out. Um, additionally, you know, um, we were also, you could also tell if multiple drivers were important um, just by looking at to see if like two models would come up in the top models for AIC selection, that kind of stuff, so. How, um, I mean, so given that you use just the single driver models and it looked like the goal was to kind of use 
the output of that to inform, you know, future management decisions or, you know, informing communities about, you know, potential for conflict with bears. I, I guess I'm just curious, how do, how do you think that having those individual models just have the one sets in them? How does, how do you think that would affect like, you know, your inference and stuff for kind of that, that larger scale question? Um, I'm not sure if it would influence it too much. Like if bears had multiple top models, then we were including uh, coefficients from all of those models. So we're including everything that's important for any specific individual bear. Okay. All right. Anybody else have any questions at the moment? It's going towards Alexander, I believe. Um, all right. Well, I'll throw out another one. Um, so you were looking mostly at you know, kind of step selection scale, and I'm just curious how you think, well, if you looked at like resource selection, these individual drivers um, uh, for, yeah, for the individual bears at, at a different scale, and, and if not, like what, how you think um, the results may have changed if you were looking at it on more of like a, a home range scale rather than kind of an individual step scale. Yeah, um, I think my collaborator is here in this chat, um, but sure, her name is Mariella, and she actually did this type of work at a broader scale. So my part of the project was look, to look at like finer scale stuff, and she was she did actually did this exercise looking at broad scale, and actually our results matched, matched really well when we were looking at habitat suitability, like the mapping part of it. So it kind of seems like this applies to all, all scales for these bears. Cool. Okay. We, uh, thanks for that. Uh, all right, we got Tabitha here. Okay. Hey, sorry, sorry on the delay there, Ryan. No, um, no worries. <laughs> I have, I have a, a loud cat. Um, I was wondering, um, Melanie, if you, like the, the spatial, the, the lack of differences between the sort of the spatial variation of that was, was pretty interesting to me. And um, I'm wondering how, how similar are the, is like what's available to these different bears across that area that you're working in. Um, there's some other work, of course, that shows that what's available can really matter. So I'm, I'm curious if that played a role in your findings. In terms of the individual variables? Um, where you had the, um, you were looking at sort of if they differed across space. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yes. I don't think I understand the question. Can you rephrase? <laughs> so, so where you were talking about the spatial, the spatial placement of the individuals. Um, mm -hmm. Did you and did you feel like uh, like are those areas similar enough across that broader landscape that that the animals had sort of similar options available to them? I guess um, that's why we I kind of took this individual modeling approach is because most, I guess most of the bears in Missouri are currently located within these large patches of forest um, and they have that available to them, but we clearly, well, we know that some bears, for example, live along some of the highways and stuff. So that's why we took this mod, I took this individual modeling approach to try to account for that uh, differences in availability. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I guess I guess you, I think what you're saying is that they were pretty different across the spatial uh, range you were looking in. Yeah, I would say most bears right now in Missouri are within these large tracts of forest. Um, as the population grows, it would be interesting to do this exercise because we know that bears will expand into suboptimal habitats. Um, so of course, you'll get more and more variation as the population continues to expand across Missouri. 
Thank you. So I know you looked at um, yeah differences in like you know, reproductive status and did see you know a, a relationship with that in terms of what the kind of top model was for those bears. Um, did you did you have the data to kind of take it to the next step and look at individual differences based on kind of uh, the age of a female's litter and, and how that might have influenced things. I'm just curious thinking, you know, a female that, that comes out of a den with uh, newborn cubs may be more motivated for, you know, the, um, you know, food, food uh, variables than the safety ones and stuff. So I was just curious if you kind of dove into that, that, you know, that next level of analysis and what you might have found. Um, I haven't actually touched that. I think it would be really hard to discern. I guess you could tell from the movement data, but it, it would, might be really hard to discern like really important um, parts of that life history. Clearly, you could tell when that she's coming out of the den, but like, at what point do we switch to uh, bears are yearlings now and they're, you know, now they're away from mom? Like, what, at what point do we make those cutoffs? Okay. Did it, uh, did it surprise, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I was just looking. Um, did it surprise you or, or was there, I guess, anything that kind of surprised you in terms of the results? Like were you surprised that, that females with cubs tended to be more risk averse and the males seemed to be more food driven or was there anything that kind of, yeah, didn't meet what your expectations were going into it? Not really. Um, I would say that black bear resource selection type of stuff has been done over and over and over again. So um, it's not anything new. I think the more exciting stuff is now inputting that information into things like a habitat suitability map and using that in connectivity and then using that in the next steps to say, okay, like these are towns perhaps that are in highly suitable areas. So maybe they're um, more susceptible to bear conflicts. So that was sort of the next steps of our work. I think we have yeah, time for one more question, Melanie. All right, I don't see any others coming in. Um, so I guess, yeah, I guess for now I'll open it. Um, if I guess if anybody has any additional questions for um, our speakers, uh, we can take some. Some we can either take the remaining time to address those, or we can kind of just dive into some, you know, a loosely um, structured dis discussion on on a topic related to connectivity. But I guess give opportunity for people to ask. Uh, some additional questions if there are any. I've seen some coming through the chats, I think mostly directed towards Alexander. It looks like he's been addressing those, but um, so I'll open it up for questions for any of the speakers now, if there's additional questions. All right, not seeing any. Okay, so yeah, I guess, um, yeah, given the, the theme of the conference and then the theme of this, um, this uh, session, you know, I think we can all agree, obviously, that maintaining corridors and, and identifying where important corridors for movement are, are located and trying to preserve those is, is a really important task, especially for large carnivores and stuff. Um, and I guess I just kind of wanted everybody's including the um you know uh, the audience's kind of perspectives but our, our panel as well uh, specifically um kind of thoughts on how you can integrate into you know corridor planning and stuff the idea that you know climate change is is likely to impact those corridors into the future and how do we kind of ensure that that our corridor designs that we're developing today will be robust to allow for whatever changes, you know, um, climate change has on, on the suitability of those for the species that we're interested in. So um, I just, yeah, kind of get some, some of your, the speaker's initial thoughts on, on that for their study systems and 
um, what, what sort of considerations do you think we need to make and, um, you know, to make sure that these, these designs that we are putting forward today kind of remain successful into the future? Uh oh, nobody's got any ideas. Um, <laughs> I, I know my study system doesn't quite apply to connectivity and corridors the same way. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess uh, this question kind of got me thinking like, okay, we can't do that much for polar bears in terms of sea ice. Um, but the Western P Hudson Bay population specifically, like they don't just migrate off of the sea ice. They also sort of migrate north along the coast. Uh, and I think one of the big issues, um, you know, more bears uh, kind of being pushed further onto land in search of more food maybe, um, or coming onto land earlier is um, knowing how to mitigate human bear interaction. I know like Churchill uh, is kind of killing it in terms of human bear interaction. Not literally. Uh, right, they have like a system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but you know, they have like a system that um, for the most part uh, has been working. Um, so I think it's just important uh, for other communities that kind of live in the regions where polar bears have historically been moving through or will eventually be moving through more um, to have plans uh, in place to, you know, so we don't just end up killing a bunch of bears, I yeah. guess. Yeah, and I think that's, yeah, with our focus on polar bears in Alaska and stuff too, I think that's kind of where we are too, like not a lot we can do with sea ice, but we can kind of do as much as we can to, to limit disruption while they're on land to reduce their energetic costs or the potential for lethal outcomes of human polar bear conflict and stuff. So I think, yeah, I think for polar bears, that's probably the way to go. I, I am curious, like Ankuta, like when you guys were doing your big, you know, effort in Romania there, did you guys have any considerations for, you know, future changes based on, how, you know, the climate projections um, in Romania and, and how that might affect where those ideal kind of corridor conditions are located for, for the, your species? It's a very good question and we are analyzing this while we are trying to gather as much data sets as we can. So for sure, we, we need to move into this, uh, this direction. Uh, I think uh, it is extremely important while having the climate change, moving the roots and, and changing species movement to have the population acceptance for the species. We need to stick on that and to, to be sure that they are accepting some changes and the uh, conflicts are not actually at a very high level as we are facing right now, as an example in my country. There were several people killed by bears in the last two years, which is quite a lot for, for the brown bear in, in, in Europe. And the people acceptance is going lower. And this also will, will impact the the connectivity and species movement and the projection of of the climate change and the second approach that we need to be and pay attention very well to it is that we need to build strong mechanisms mechanism that could be adapted to various uh, changes that could be over time we will never build the perfect connectivity, a perfect network, or perfect corridor. But we, we need to be sure that we are, present, we are preserving as much as we do have 
the intact land as we do have right now further to either include more or to change. Yeah, you cut out a little bit on the end there, but then it seems like it caught up really quick. So I think we got most of that. But yeah, thank you. I, yeah, I'm glad to hear that that it's definitely yeah something that's that's being considered and stuff. And yeah, I think <clears throat> there are you know big questions, and and I don't think there's any easy answers to them for sure. So anybody else have any any thoughts on the topic? Or? Or any other questions? I guess we can like, yeah. If there's questions that come in for the speakers too, we can just kind of throw those up as as we go. Or, or we have about, yeah, I guess nine more minutes in this session. So, um, okay. Uh, Kate is telling me to remind people to go. Oops, remind people to go to the live poster session at ten fifteen. So that's. 15 minutes after this session ends, and then you can visit the virtual booths with the poster presenters in that session. So, um, so yeah, I guess maybe one other kind of topic that I that I am just kind of curious about people's perspectives on is I think you know <clears throat> you can develop these really broad and well designed you know plans of, of connectivity, and even if you get you know local, regional, and national government buy-in to it, it seems like there's always just going to be like um, um, <clears throat> the possibility or, you know, that there's always going to be, well, we, you know, we need to make this road. So this is just going to, we're just going to cut through this one corridor, but we'll still have all the rest remain. But through time, you know, it's going to be this kind of incremental, you know, destruction in it. And so I guess I'm just curious from your guys's um study systems and, and countries and stuff you know are there do you feel like there's strong enough mechanisms in place to keep that from happening or or is that just going to be a problem that we're always faced with that we'll have these really great plans and then just slowly through time as as economic needs or growth of the population occurs they'll just kind of start eating away at it and then we'll end up back at a kind of a, a bad place again that we'll be starting a new Trish, uh, oh, where did you, hold on? Sorry, Trishna. I lowered your hand before I unmuted you. There we go. I think. All right, Trishna, I think you're, yeah, you're unmuted now. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, I was just going to say that from my experience in India, I think corridors, although they have a legal, um, some kind of a designation uh, in the policy space, it's still the areas that get hammered a lot for all kind of infrastructure development. So even with a policy like layer on it, um, all the demands for roads, you know, mining, all of that, um, the whole pressure is on corridors and it's always one project at a time with no long-term vision in place about, you know, if we allow this to happen, then in the future, this other thing cannot happen. It's always one case at a time. Yep. Uh, yep. And I don't know if any country has that part, you know, set. It's it's always yeah. the same problem I hear. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that's the, the, the biggest issue is even, I mean, even in the United States where we have, you know, um, official like wilderness designations, you know, I think we're seeing now that those can also be susceptible to changes, you know, if, if Congress or whatever wants to make those changes. And so you'll have this area that's been preserved for 40, 50 years, but then all of a sudden, if there's, you know, some other incentive that uh, makes it worthwhile to remove that and <laughs> that it's kind of all for nothing. So 
Yeah. I mean, I've had I've had protected area managers say we don't want corridors because they're very difficult to manage. Mm -hmm. There are no discrete boundaries per se. So I want a protected area that is fenced and I will lift animals from one place to the other, which is a terrible idea, of course. But <laughs> from a manager's point of view, that's a very discreet, you know, this is your boundary and yep. you, you know, you do the whole translocation process and all of that, which is very disheartening. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, presumably very expensive too. So, Back to yeah, uh, it looks like Brian Sheik uh, Sheik said even highly endangered Florida panthers have not stopped highways or urban development. Florida did build about twenty six underpasses along two separate highways to help, but as Ryan said, development continues. Best we can get is some adjustment to it. All right, uh, and Puta, I think. I just wanted to add that um, just an idea from our experience is that we are trying to change the things while uh, conducting the environmental impact studies. And we are trying to agree with the road developers and designers, which are the best variants in order to uh, avoid fragmentation and to adopt the best mitigation measures. So they are presenting four or five alternatives out of which together we are choosing one case by case, of course. Mm -hmm. Even if the, the general mechanism exists, for sure the particularities needs to be treated by case by case. And we are providing our knowledge and our data sets for, for, for those cases. Oh, that's, yeah, that's good to hear. <clears throat> Thanks for that. Um, well, I guess, yeah, if, uh, last call for anybody's thoughts. I think we have three minutes left, and um, so we can call it good if nobody has anything else they would like to say. Uh, I'll give you like 10 seconds to throw your hand up or something. Um, but yeah, otherwise, uh, I really yeah, appreciate all the, the speakers um, and their yeah, presentations were all really great. And it's always fun to see, um, you know, get outside of our little regional, um, even national bubbles sometimes to see what, what work is going on internationally uh, on bears. So yeah, it's been really great. And thank you all for participating today and for uh, really great questions and discussions and um, I think with that, we'll bid you all adieu and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference. And um, I'm sure the, the speakers are probably happy if you follow up with any additional questions with them directly. So thank you again, thank you again for the speakers and uh, the audience participation. And I hope you guys all have a really great rest of the conference. <laughs>